couple of words about myself. One is I am the chair of the identity and capital markets SIG identity working group and capital markets SIG and Hyperledger. I've been involved in Hyperledger since its inception. I was in the first meetings. I actually wrote the template for the Hyperledger improvement proposal that everybody has to go through, every project has to go through to get into the uh, get into incubation inside Hyperledger. So all projects that are currently in Hyperledger have followed that process. Um, and it's been an exciting journey uh, watching the progression of um, events in Hyperledger and the way the community has developed and uh, coalesced. Two things about me. Uh, one is that I am a technologist through and through. I have worked in various industries and in the fixed income space for about 15 or 20 years. So I'm very familiar with capital markets, uh, especially the technology end. And I went through a crisis uh, with the uh, 2008-2009 and I'm familiar with what happened afterwards and of course I've been involved with blockchain, Bitcoin uh, and various other um, thought in this space for more than five years and I try to bridge the gap between technology and business. With that said, let me go to the next slide. The agenda is going to be interoperability. Uh, then we segue into the various other aspects that are necessary to implement interoperability properly. We simply go into uh, a particular proposal from BAFT for in the trade finance area that is a single message that's called a digital ledger payment commitment. And we will examine why that is so important. And then um, the SWIFT ISO 2022 and the cryptographic uh, extensions And finally, we'll go into the lab proposal that I have made and have done some work on this. It's called XCSI, Cross-Chain Settlement Instruction. Um, so without further uh, waiting for that, I, I go into interoperability. Interoperability is a, uh, I, I just wanted to get a one word one sentence uh, answer to this, which is ability of two, more, two or more systems to exchange information and mutually use this information. And it's based on ISO 19941 2017. And in this talk, I'm specifically focusing on digital currency interoperability. So the only other change I've made to the uh, previous slide is the fact that I say that at least one of the systems should be a digital currency system. So I start off with four, but it's actually meant to be interrupt.1. So I'm looking at several ways of looking at interoperability. One of them is the uh, a layered approach, which is starting with the transport, the syntactic, uh, semantic, and behavioral and policy implications. Since uh, this is supposed to be a technical talk, we'll focus on the last, uh, the first three elements, first three layers, but obviously 
all the other layers depend on the performance of this these three layers. And I have some examples of uh, the layers on the on this side, and I see that. Uh, the capability increases. The another way of looking at it is, you know, it, this is a very busy diagram, but it shows you the complexity of any kind of digital currency interoperability because you can look at it from so many different angles. Uh, it is easy to get lost, but I think one of the things we have to do is to get this complexity under control. Uh, one of the other ways in which you can look at it, which uh, I lead the Dig Digital Currency Global Initiative Interoperability Working Group. So I have the pleasure of interacting with many uh, expert, Eric Cohen, uh, who's based this particular way of looking at things on capability maturity model. Um, of course, the names that are given here are completely his own and they have no bearing on CMM. But the idea is that you can measure what is happening in the space and you can decide where you are in the journey from total chaos to the ideal state. And the ideal state is not static. You have to keep evolving as uh, the state goes on. So that's, that is the idea of this slide. And uh, this one is another way of looking at interoperability, which is a horizontal and a vertical model. That means, suppose there is a digital currency system A and another digital currency system B, they can interact with each other and they can interact with the user-facing applications uh, which is marked here as two. And they can also interact with the legacy and external data systems. Normally, oracles, various uh, reporting applications, and so on. So suppose digital currency system A is, uh, let's say, Bitcoin and digital currency system B is Ethereum. Both of them are completely unaware of each other, obviously. So in order to interact, there, have to, there has to be some kind of intermediaries in the picture, which I do not show here. Uh, so the number one would be currency is being sent from one system to the other through something like Uniswap or some other way of interacting, that would be one. Uh, we are also aware of all of the wallets and everything else that come in the uh, number two. And number three would be legacy and external data. So this is a waypoint. Uh, we have gone through the various interoperability model models, and now I'm um, going to start talking about operation oper, oper, operationalizing interoperability. Try saying that fast. Uh, similar to uh, the concept of universal description, discovery, and integration (UDDI), or similar to the domain name system. So that means. In order to operationalize, you have to somehow you have to have registries. You have to way have a way of discovering the other 
uh, system and you have to be able to pass messages between one one and the other and of course this depends on standards standard schema standard ways of looking at things now i'm going to do uh, an escape here and look at the uh, chat window to see whether there are any questions or anything that's uh, Okay, I, I do not see any specific questions, so I'm going to go back to the uh, presentation that I have. So in the in the in this context, we want to talk about something called a Ricardian contract, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, not in that specific name, with that specific name, but uh, various ways of looking at things. Uh, the Ricardian contract is a software pattern. Uh, it is a single, well, it unites the human readable contract to the machine parsable uh, contract. So why am I talking about contracts here? Because Really speaking, the transport of value from one system to another should be driven by some contracts, some promise, some obligation, some way of saying, okay, I want to pay you. Uh, I want to take some money that I have in this system and I want to pay you in that system. Uh, so that's, that's the whole idea. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, hash, hash time lock and various other forms of um, actually transporting the value, but I'll just focus on the messaging part. Anyway, going back to the Ricardian contract, it is a human readable document that has markups that allow it to be parsable. And it is an immutable commitment using hashing and signatures and implementable using a smart contract. And the dispute, dispute resolution uses the original contract, which is available not only to the issuer of the uh, exchange, but also to, to the recipient, and they know fully well what the obligations are. This applies normally to the issuing of a bigger sort of, a, let's say, a security that has a larger life. In, in the case of an exchange of value between two between two digital currency systems, it is more of a ephemeral, a short-lived contract. But uh, this I idea of a parsable but human-readable contract that then is implementable using a smart contract and it is also signed by the issuer and possibly by the recipient after receiving the uh, the exchange is contained self-contained in this one four corners of the page and this is the um a reflection of the recording contract that shows that the written contract is collapsed into a hash, which is a commitment, which cannot be revoked. And then it flows from there into the world of accountancy, where payments are then made. Uh, I want to just show a couple of examples of these, even though these people do not call it a recording contract, it is, it is uh, by the virtue of the fact 
that it's in JSON and it can be read by humans, obviously it would be better to uh, make this into a document, but this is called a digital ledger payment commitment and it's created under the BAFT or Big Bank Bankers Association for Finance and Trade. And it's completely open source. It is a instrument that can uh, that is complete is legally binding, enforceable, and negotiable. And this can be done with just a handful of data points, which in include commitments or signatures or attestations, and also, of course, the hash of this data. So this is a very simple concept. You, you have, so now the complexity of the interoperability surface has been reduced to this uh, very short document and very short message, really. And that can essentially transfer value. You don't even really need a, a blockchain or DLT, but normally this is uh, this unites the supply side of the, con the supply chain side of where you know a, somebody is actually creating a product, selling it to someone else. Uh, but the payment comes later, so the uh, the consignee, the committee, uh, I mean the committer, promises to pay later. Promises to pay, and that now becomes a legally binding, enforceable document. But the beauty of this document is that it's negotiable. That means that. I, as a supplier who's got this document, now can take that document to somebody else and sell it to them uh, for obviously a, a smaller amount. And, uh, and it's a better document because that's what negotiable means. So it becomes very similar to cash. It is a bearer instrument, which is completely digital. Um, our aim is to uh, reproduce some of these qualities in uh, transporting value from one uh, digital currency system to another digital currency system. Um, of course, uh, we are aware of SWIFT and the ISO 2022. SWIFT itself is based completely on transport of messages. And ISO 2022 is a standard for standards, but it does have more than 65 or so uh, schemas for the transport of uh, standard financial transactions. And SWIFT is the registration authority for ISO 2022. And if you look at the ideas or look at the way in which uh, governments are approaching uh, CBDCs, you can say that see that many of them are going to be relying heavily on ISO 20 or 22. Unfortunately, ISO 20 or 22 uh, is, is a rather sprawling standard. So if you look at the uh, DLPC, which we just saw, it is very short. It doesn't have too many uh, data items, uh, but Swift has, you know, reams and reams of XML, uh, and they lacked the hashing and signatures in the document, which, which I, in the schemas, which I thought was kind of strange because, <clears throat> because that cryptographic uh, basis is what would give the document immutability. They subsequently have made those modifications uh, to the standard and it's 
part of the optional header structure now. Uh, so message-based transport of value has been around for a while, and it's being done every day through Swift. Obviously, the Swift regular Swift messages do lack the uh, hashing and signatures, proper signatures embedded in the document, and that causes uh, problems. Anyway, I'm going to before I do the final section, I'm going to uh, look at the chat again and see if there are any questions I need to answer. Just bear with me. Uh, I guess there are a couple of Q and A's which I'll uh, come to later. Um, chat, Craig's uh, question: What are the most mature methods of uh, interoperability you see at the moment? DLPC, for example, Digital Ledger Payment Commitment, is live, so it is very mature. And obviously, all of the ways in which uh, money, uh, the values transform back both into and out of um, uh, most of the uh, public blockchains are maturing, one can say. I mean, the most uh, salient form of that is, uh, I mean, salient. Uh, idea around that is the idea of AMM, automatic market making, which is you know part of the Uniswap protocol. Uh, there are other forms in Polkadot and others that are quite mature. Anyway, I go back to the presentation, and I'm going to talk about a few things uh, that are very concrete about. The proposal that we are making uh, in Hyperledger Labs. And this is a project that I proposed and created in Hyperledger Labs called Cross Chain Settlement Instruction. It is very nascent. I mean, not much work has been done in, in this, but we have tried to create at least a skeleton of a message back settlement instruction. So it looks very much like DLPC, but it's a, it's a different beast. The number of items there are limited to like 10 to 15. The schema is defined in JSON. It is not based on an atomic swaps, swap uh, because everybody in uh, interoperability is going for atomic swaps, which I think is not the right way to look at things. Maybe in the retail context, it's important. But in the enterprise context, uh, netting prevails for various reasons. So this is for counterparties with uh, existing master agreements. And it is, of course, non-reputable and immutable with hashing and signatures, the most elemental concepts around blockchain. Uh, hashing, in particular, is a very powerful idea. Uh, the message is freestanding and transport agnostic. Uh, it's similar to DIDCOM in that way. DIDCOM is a effort by Ares um, and a discovery mechanism called chain name service is proposed for this uh, to fully implement something like this. Uh, I'm just giving you a bare bones sketch of this, uh, the schema and data elements. Everything is standardized. For example, the timestamp is a secure timestamp, uh, which is follows the ANSI X9.95 standard. The message ID is a UU ID, which is very familiar to most programmers. Uh, 
and the message signature is a digital signature from the origin. And the origin is the name of the chain in a chain name service. Well, this is more uh, a thought experiment than an actuality at this point, but we are going to propose uh, a way to implement chain name service. That means how do you discover uh, the characteristics of a chain just knowing the name. This is very similar to the way DNS works. DNS, as you know, is a database, but it's implemented as a text file. Uh, it is not only the IP address of the party you are connecting to that is available in that database. It has things like uh, the who, who's a registrant, how do you contact them, you know, various other other uh, pieces of data about the domain. Similarly, the chain name service will, uh, will allow us to discover a lot more about the guarantees surrounding uh, the chain. And in the amount, of course, it, there is the numeric payment amount, but when you go to currency, it, is, it gets more interesting because currently ISO 40, 4217 covers uh, the ground for regular um, three-letter codes, but a new standard, ISO 24165, is uh, going to address cryptocurrencies. And similar to the way in which we talked about the domain name service, the oh, so it's uh, it's 410 already. So anyway, so basically everything is standardized, uh, and I think this is the end of the session. So I'm going to go back to the uh, to the window, and I'm going to look at the chat and see. Uh, how we are doing with chat and everything seems to be fine and I'm going to end the session and leave I leave the session thank you